media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He's speaking to us from Japan, where he has worked and lived since 2004. Welcome back to the show, James. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Always a pleasure. And I'm sure you're glad to hear your Calgary Stampeders have already clinched a playoff berth. Yahoo! (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Do you wear your white cowboy hat in in Japan? (laughs) I I think I forgot it today, but I'll I'll dig it out of the closet. Now, Japan being hit by a number of typhoons uh, lately, is that pretty typical for this time of year? Uh, par for the course. Uh, the last few years have been a bit quiet, so uh, this one seems maybe a bit busier than usual, but I think this is probably not too far outside the realm of the normal. Could you describe Japan as perhaps the most disaster-prepared country on the planet? <laughs> Disaster-prone, certainly. Disaster-prepared, I hope so. But uh, yeah, I think the consciousness of the various disasters here is uh, generally pretty high, and of course that's because there are so many. Whether it's earthquakes or typhoons or tsunamis or volcanoes, we pretty much have it all. Um, luckily, I'm in the one little pocket of the country that for some reason does not have any volcanoes, does not get tsunamis. Typhoons don't really hit so hard and earthquakes generally are 100 miles away or more. So pretty safe where I am. actually. And where is that? Uh, it's halfway between Osaka and Hiroshima on the west side of the main island. Um, but, of course, having said that, we just had those historic floods uh, that were just the one town over from me. So, knock on wood, I guess. Now, poor Indonesia. It's been hit by earthquake, tsunami, uh, volcano. They're not very lucky this year either. No, and I was just hearing about the latest evacuation of 70,000 people or something like that. Yeah, no, Indonesia has been battered quite a bit recently and, uh, you know, unfortunate situation. But these things do happen and they happen. They seem to happen a lot here in, in Asia for some reason. And right now, too, we have currency crises underway in both Indonesia and India with the Indian rupee down to a record low. And the experts are saying it's unlikely the central bank will be able to bail it out. What do you see there? Uh, well, I mean, some people have been talking about a repeat of the uh, the rupee crisis that we saw a few years ago, and perhaps for some of the same reasons as we start to see rates, or as we continue at this point to see rates rising in the U.S., and we see a lot of the uh, liquidity that's been sloshed around uh, the world really starting to uh, to be sucked back in uh, as dollars come home to to roost, I suppose, uh, we are seeing the attendant uh, drop in the rupee. And uh, and yes, it, it looks like this one could be particularly hard hit. Um, of course, we've seen some of uh, the Modi government's ideas on economic and monetary policies in the past, like their disastrous idea to basically overnight make uh, something like 80% of the uh, currency in the economy invalid um, and requiring people to turn in their old notes for new notes. Um, so we'll see if they have any disaster ideas this time. But uh, unfortunately, those types of ideas tend to be more disastrous than than actually letting the pain play out, um, which might be what's required in this uh, chaos. Up until now, India has had one of the highest growth rates in the world, around 8 percent a year. Is this expected to slow that right down? Uh, it's almost certain that it will affect uh, that growth rate. And I, I think this is obviously reflective of the global situation generally. Uh, we are seeing a global slowdown in trade as we see the looming trade war coming. And obviously that's most uh, most evident in the U.S.-China uh, trade war. But of course, it's having knock-on effects around the world. And I think India is going to be affected by that one way or another. And the currency crisis, at the very least, plays into that, even if it's not necessarily the cause of that slowdown. It will certainly exacerbate it. 
uh, I, economist uh, report I saw said China could see the yuan lose another 10% if their trade war with the U.S. continues. Do you see that? Well, it, it seems to be going that way uh, at the moment. And it's interesting. We have kind of a, a tale of competing narratives, one being put out by J.P. Morgan right now, which just downgraded Chinese stocks and are warning that uh, a full-blown trade war, quote-unquote, could start by uh, next year. Um, between China and the U.S., and that's why they're doing this downgrade now. And uh, so we do see Chinese stocks uh, uh, sliding as a result of this. But contrast that with UBS, which is actually, for uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, but they are seeing that, oh, actually, this is a prime buying opportunity, and foreign investors are going to be basically buying up the slack. So uh, you actually had uh, Thomas uh, Dongming Fang, who's the head of uh, China Equities at UBS, uh, U- UBS Group AG, saying he would definitely be a buyer from here. And basically, the narrative here is that uh, global uh, international investors are making up a greater and greater share of Chinese stock purchases, uh, especially um, A-, A shares. And it, it seems that uh, there may be a ray of hope for investors here. Well, yes, it's going to definitely this is going to have some short term pain. But if China comes through and on survives to the other side, there will be some big opportunities. So I think some people might see this as a buying opportunity. Perhaps that's just uh, wishful think on, thinking on UBS's part to try to go against the trend and perhaps uh, breathe some life into the uh, Chinese stock market. But at least short term, it seems there's no way that uh, China's yuan and stocks cannot avoid a a hit from this do you think this uh, currency contagion can spread global globally it absolutely can and uh, again we've seen destabilization in a lot of places uh, argentina and venezuela and india and indonesia and now china potentially um, so it, it's uh, I, I, it's been called contagion. People are throwing that word around, and I'm not sure that these are necessarily linked. But as I say, the uh, the threat of a trade war between two of the largest trading partners or powers in the world is going to throw a monkey wrench into the, the into the narrative that had been developing that global trade uh, growth was basically locked in, and we were going to see this period of prosperity. Pros- prosperity, I think the prognosticators will have to re-prognosticate that one as this uh, starts to happen. And as these currency destabilizations do seem to feed into a narrative of decline, which uh, seems to be the way things are heading now. So unless there is some tra- uh, some drastic reversal in this uh, in the next few months, I think we are looking towards a period where currency destabilization will become much more, uh, much more pr- pronounced. And that doesn't necessarily mean the plunging of currencies, although it does have that effect, but uh, also the raising of the U.S. dollar, at least relative to other currencies, will be part of that. And that, again, will affect um, the the purchases uh, that global investors are making and whether or not they want to uh, send their dollars out abroad or whether they want to bring them in back home. It seems that rising interest rates in the U.S. have preceded other recessions. Do you think it's going to do the same thing this time? It certainly can. Um, it really depends on how much the Fed has really spiked to the punch bowl and how quickly they're going to withdraw the spiking and whether pe- the investors will be able to take the hangover. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that. So obviously no crystal ball here and I can't say for sure how this will play out, but it's uh, certainly going to uh, to have an effect on the momentum uh, in the markets. And of course, this is necessary because as we've talked about before, uh, 93% of the rise in markets between the collapse of the Lehman crisis in 2008 and, uh, and 2016, when the analysis was run, 93% of the rise in stock markets in the U.S. in that period was directly attributable to the Fed and quantitative easing. So uh, as they start to withdraw the not just uh, take away the, the easy credit, but now start to draw some of that back up the straw with the rising rates, obviously that's going to uh, adjust the the trading outlook um, uh, for a lot of business, uh, well, investors, and then, of course, that's going to hit companies involved directly. So um, we'll see. Of course, we have seen some, some forward momentum in the U.S. economy uh, during the Trump era, but uh, whether this will completely offset that, it remains to be seen. And again, I think it depends how quickly and how uh, strongly the, uh, the Fed basically puts on that break. We'll have more with James Corbett right after the break. 
Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, has Japanese business been hit by Trump tariffs? Well, actually, um, speaking of Federal Reserve tightening and the overall economic situation, at least uh, the news I can report today is that the yen has actually hit a one-year low um, after this, uh, this uh, Treasury yields have jumped. And that is a good thing for the Japanese economy, which is heavily export dependent. So uh, a, a low yen is generally good for business here in Japan, although it does create problems for imports of energy and other key resources. But uh, but generally speaking, the business outlook is good when uh, the yen is down. And we're also seeing a rise in uh, 10 year Japanese government bonds. Um, they went up 0.145% in the last 24 hours. So that's something um but uh generally that is followed by the uh the boj basically stepping in and, and buying up uh, bonds to try to keep yields down uh now that the yen is weakening they may have some room to not take that extra step they may just let this uh rise a little so uh, things are uh, not necessarily bleak in the short term here in japan in the long term, I think the overall effects of a full-blown trade war, as J.P. Morgan is warning about, um, would, uh, again, would hit every corner of the globe, including, of course, uh, Japan. But uh, that, that might be next year's worry. At least for the short term, it seems the Japanese economy has some signs for optimism. Is Japan uh, negotiating a new trade deal with the U.S.? I think they're constantly negotiating with the U.S. in this Trump era. And so we've seen... Uh, Abe and Trump have formed some sort of relationship, um, uh, and they have met several times, including most recently in New York during the uh, UN uh, General Assembly. But again, it's a lot of kind of paper promises or just uh, uh, promises that aren't even written down. Um, so uh, we'll have to see how the relationship develops. But they're certainly in the process of negotiating and trying to get... Um, uh, well, the, the sticking point at this particular juncture is the threat that the U.S. has placed on J Japanese auto automobiles, on, on cars, car manufacturing of a 25 percent tariff. And so that's the threat that uh, Trump has been using for leverage in these negotiations. Um, but uh, it seems that uh, Abe may, may be able to get out from under that. Uh, again, negotiations are still underway. So and and. I think if there's anything that we've learned in during the Trump era so far, it's that nothing is in the bank and you can't really expect anything until it's uh, signed and done and, and uh, already a done deal. And even then, you might have to look over your shoulder. So I don't think these, t t these negotiations are going to end so long as Abe and Trump are in power. I think that it's going to be an ongoing and sort of continuing art of the deal, if you will. Is there any concern that now Canada and Mexico have a tentative agreement with the U.S.? Trump will turn his full ire on Asia, particularly China. It's a possibility, and I'm sure this is not uh, this does not escape the Japanese parliamentarians um, that this may actually be Trump freeing up one of his fronts in this trade war to focus more heavily on Asia. I, again, I think the the greatest threat in that regard would be towards China, but Japan certainly seems to be one of the at least collateral victims of this, if not actually a direct victim, as we've seen um, with the steel tariffs and other things, um, again, directly affecting J Japan. So, uh, yes, I mean, ultimately, the the less fronts there are in this trade war, the more Asia will feel the brunt of what's happening with the U.S. right now. And I think uh, 
I think uh, Japanese politicians and, and everyone else are, are acutely aware of that. We'll have more with James Corbett right after this. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, uh, a consortium of companies, Royal Shell, uh, PetroChina, and so on, have uh, now a tentative deal to build a $40 billion LNG plant in Kitimat. Is that good news for Asian consumers? Uh, it certainly could be. Um, obviously, uh, the Japanese economy heavily dependent on imports of LNG, especially in this era where uh, so many of the nuclear reactors have been taken offline. Um, some of them have come back online since uh, Fukushima, but uh, not enough to really supply all of the energy needs for Japan. So LNG imports are up. So, New suppliers and new sources of uh, of LNG and other other energy imports are very important for Japan. So theoretically, this could be good for the trading relationship between Japan and uh, and other countries. Is Japan uh, growing uh, alternative sources of energy right now? Uh, there are always things in the works, but they always seem quite theoretical and off in the distance. Uh, Japan obviously has a ready share of geothermal potential energy, um, given that it is on the ring of fire and is prone to earthquakes and, and volcanoes and such. Uh, that obviously indicates a lot of geothermal potential, but uh, most of that at this time is being used uh, for hot springs, essentially, um, which is very much part of Japanese culture. And so there isn't as much incentive for uh, people to go in and develop the energy resource so much as to use it as a cheap and easy way to get t tourist money, basically. Um, so that hasn't been developed to its full potential. But even then, it would only indicate a small fraction of the overall energy market here. Uh, other more, even more innovative, but even more far off ideas are still under development, uh, tidal energy being one of the key ones, which if unlocked would obviously for an island nation like japan uh, would be very beneficial uh, if they could really unlock tidal power but again these technologies seem seem far off at any rate from being developed into something that will really be able to power the japanese economy so at this point uh it's it's still nuclear is still a big part of the equation and the japanese government sees no plans to uh, to scrap that anytime soon despite even the former Japanese prime minister, the wildly popular Koizumi, um, be coming out against uh, nuclear power. He's not in power anymore, so he doesn't have that say. And the current government is perfectly fine with uh, nuclear power in the long run. And it's LNG and petrochemicals and uh, trading with Iran and other places, uh, to the extent that they're able to do so, will continue to uh, power the Japanese economy. What's happening with the Fukushima cleanup? Uh, Fukushima, obviously an ongoing situation, but I think we're in something of a holding mode where, uh, I think the, the primary, uh, objective at this point for the Japanese government and TEPCO is to make sure that the, the problem is at least seen to be contained, uh, as long as, uh, until the point at which the, the Tokyo Olympics come and go. And I think at that point, I, I have a feeling, just let me use my crystal ball here, I have a feeling we're going to see some stories about, oh, did you know we just discovered, oh, there's this problem with the Fukushima cleanup that we weren't reporting on for the last couple of years for some reason. I, that's just my hunch, but I have nothing firm to go on with that. But I think definitely until uh, Tokyo Olympics come and go, I think Japan, the Japanese government has highly motivated to cover up any problems that are going on there. Um, but just uh, last month, we did see the first officially recognized death related to the Fukushima cleanup, um, which was uh, the death of one of the workers uh, do doing the decontamination at the site. So um, so it's, it is an ongoing concern, but you'll notice there isn't as much uh, press about it these days. If Godzilla raises his head, you know the problem is still going on. <laughs> yeah, 
And that's about right. And uh, yes, I mean, that gives you a, a certain sense of the Japanese psyche in general. Obviously, Godzilla um, first popping up, I believe, and was it the late 40s or early 50s at any rate, um, in obviously right in the post-World War II era where the idea of nuclear energy being unleashed on Japan was obviously fresh and, and f- uh, foremost in people's minds. And strangely enough, Japan became one of the first and one of the most enthusiastic adopters of nuclear energy after being the first and only victim of wartime bombing, uh, nuclear bombing. That's uh, that's something. And that uh, took a lot of propaganda to get to the, the public to embrace nuclear energy to the point that it did. Uh, I think Fukushima has rightly set that back uh, quite a bit. So it's uh, a lot of damage control um, as much as it is cleanup um, in the physical sense. James, anything else uh, you'd like to tell us about? Uh, There's always stuff going on, and uh, this week in the International Forecaster, I'm going to be writing about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is due to release a special report on 1.5 degree Celsius global warming uh, in the next week or so. So I'm going to write a little little preview of that if people are interested in checking that out at theinternationalforecaster.com. James, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me on. My guest has been James Corbett, publisher of thecorbettreport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He was speaking to us from Japan. If you have any questions for James or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.